A man stands above the Florence dunes, watching the sand blow. Once, nothing grew here. The dunes moved and shifted, grew and spread, but now, grass grows here. It was introduced by humans to anchor the dunes, to keep them stable, to make them into something else. This gives the man an idea. The year was 1957. The man, Frank Herbert. Even if you were a science fiction fanatic back then, it's unlikely that you'd have known his name. At this point, he'd only written one novel, The Dragon in the Sea, a near-future story about a world running out of resources where submarine crews from the West try to steal underwater oil reserves from the East to fuel their ongoing war. While it was first published in Astounding, you're as likely to find it in the thriller section today as you are in the sci-fi shelves. But he, out on those dunes, was looking for a new story. Not a sci-fi story, though. He'd actually gone to those dunes for a very different purpose. You see, he'd spent much of his career as a journalist, and he'd gone out to the Oregon coast in hopes that he could get some magazine to pay him to do a story about how the dunes were being reclaimed. Truth was, it was actually even simpler than that. He really was down there mostly in hopes that he'd find someone to underwrite him so he could be nearer to his wife, who was living in Florence, Oregon at the time. But the image of those dunes in the picture he took as his little charter plane rose into the sky above them, becoming waving golden ripples on a fine ocean of sand, would stay with him. Dune wouldn't be completed for years yet. Perpetually broke, he would become a political speechwriter, try his hand and fail at writing for TV, learn about Zen, move to San Francisco, rejoin the newspaper industry as a night editor for the San Francisco Examiner, study the I Ching, and dive yet deeper into Jungian philosophy before the book came out. But the whole time, he plugged away at the work. Something in him knew that this piece, his desert story, was the one, the thing that would finally let him break through. And eight years after he spent that day on the Oregon coast looking at how European beach grass was transforming the sands, he turned out to be right. But the path to Dune as we know it was a long one. Dune itself actually began as a haiku. <laughs> yeah, the 181,000-word novel began as a poem less than 18 words long. There was a method in this madness, though. Herbert felt that the haiku was the perfect form for expressing images of nature and setting a tone. If he could get it right there, he'd know what he had to deliver on for the whole novel. From there, he researched ecology, psychology, tribal cultures from arid regions across the globe, and ESP. He would draw inspiration from everything and bring it back to his book. Once on a trip to Mexico, he was walking through an arroyo, heard his footsteps echoing off the banks, and immediately began to pen notes about drum sand. But as enthusiastic about his novel as he was, others were less so. Publisher after publisher rejected the novel, telling him, It's just too long! Or that people can't even get through the first hundred pages. Others found his idea of a trilogy strange. Because what we now have as the first Dune book was actually originally three separate books that luckily got put into one. But unlike other multi-part sci-fi novels of the time, there's no great jump chronologically or distance-wise between the episodes. And so the rejections rolled in. One after another, each of the big sci-fi publishers passed. But one person saw it and knew its value. John W. Campbell. Perhaps the last great hurrah of an illustrious career, Campbell decided to serialize it and publish it in Analog Magazine under the name Dune World. As the first part was being published, Campbell and Herbert went back and forth in long philosophical letters about things like the nature of time and the difficulty of writing characters with superpowers that were just too good. Herbert took many of Campbell's suggestions, like not killing Aaliyah, and worked to refine parts he'd recommended, like better clarifying the holes in Paul's future sight even as early parts of the serialized novel hit the stands. But as Herbert prepared the second and third sections for Analog Magazine, more rejections were arriving every day. It looked like the book was never going to find a life as anything but a set of magazine pieces. But in the background, something was slowly starting to happen. People were taking notice. Analog was still the greatest of the sci-fi magazines, and Campbell still had many friends in the science fiction community. People were reading the story, and other science fiction authors were talking about the story. 
Then, it got nominated for a Hugo. Sure, it lost to Here Gather the Stars, but it didn't really matter. The story had fans. And one of those fans was from an unlikely source. His name was Sterling Lanier, the editor of Chilton Books. Herbert and his agent hadn't sent a copy to Chilton because they were a publisher of car repair manuals. But Lanier had read the story in Analog and liked it so much, he hunted down Herbert's agent and made them an offer. He wanted to print all three books as one hardbound novel named Dune. Herbert ecstatically accepted. They went all out with radio ads and newspaper clips, as Herbert himself leaned on his old journalist and bookstore connections to get it more notice. Prestigious science fiction authors were already starting to call it one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time. And within a year, the newly formed Nebula Awards were planning to name it Best Novel. And Harlan Ellison was writing Herbert to ask him if he could make it to the award ceremony dinner. But in the short term, the publishers were right. It cost too much to print, and too few people bought it, because it was part of a niche genre at the time. Sterling Lanier lost his job. But he was supportive of Herbert and the book to the end. He sent Frank a note, saying that he'd made an important and powerful book, and that he was glad he got to be a part of it, even if, humble to the last, he said that his contribution to it was largely seeing something great and finding out how to reach Herbert's agent from John Campbell. And he ended the note by saying he hoped to meet Frank Herbert in person one day. I don't know if they ever did. The next year, though, Dune sales began to pick up. And although Analog rejected a sequel, Galaxy picked it up. Hip colleges started to teach the book in literature classes, and it got buzz as an underground masterpiece. Dune not only survived, it soon became the center of the science fiction universe. So continue your training and keep trusting UA implicitly, because we begin our pilgrimage to Arrakis proper next time. What could go wrong? Oh, yeah, uh, that. Hmm.